with us today. Uh, he is the professor and chairman of the Department of uh, Urology at New York Medical College. Um, and he's gonna be speaking with us about uh, renal cell carcinoma um, for the in-service review. Um, and hopefully we can get through some uh, possible in-service prep questions at the end, um, but I'm sure we're in for a, a very exciting and um, uh, interesting review of uh, renal cell carcinoma. So thank you for taking the time and uh, I'll give the floor. Very good. So, Jamiat? I'm sorry, I didn't catch that. Can you see the slide? Uh, we can see the slides. It's still in like a, a PowerPoint mode. You may want to, if you can Hello. make it like a, a full screen. Uh, sure, yeah. hold on one second, I'll put it on. How about now? Yeah, it's perfect. Very good, okay. All right. So again, thank you very much, uh, really. I think uh, Gina, Alex, uh, Miad, uh, Amanda, you guys are doing a wonderful job in really teaching our residents. So uh, let me start. Uh, my charge today really is uh, basically talking on renal cell cancer staging uh, management and really tie it to the 2017 AUA guideline. And then we will talk a little bit about the hereditary syndromes. So what I'll start with uh, epidemiology briefly, staging, management. And I really want to talk about the role of comorbidities, baseline renal function in the management of renal mass. We'll talk a little bit about the tumor size, the complexity of uh, tumor uh, in the kidney, the nephromatrix score. We'll talk a little bit about the role of renal mass biopsy. Then we can talk a little bit about active surveillance, partial nephrectomy, radical nephrectomy, thermal ablation, and the role of each of these uh, modalities in the management of renal tumor. And more importantly, I'll try to tie it all to the 2017 guidelines. So briefly about renal cancer, in 2020, the estimated number of new cases to be seen is close to 74,000 and approximately 14,000 deaths will be directly related to renal cancer. If you look at over the past almost 25 years since 1992, uh, that is 3% increase in the incidence of renal cancer every year. And in 2017, there is approximately 16.1 cases diagnosed per 100,000 person per year. It was 10 per 100,000 case in 1992. However, since 2018 and now, it's, uh, the incidence seems to have plateaued. So maybe we have seen the best of the imaging studies uh, that detected most of the incidental renal tumors. What is important really is the median age of diagnosis is 64 years. And uh, most of the diagnosed cases of renal cancer are seen in men between the age of, in people uh, between age of 65 and 74 years. What is important in this chart, then close to 40% of all renal tumors are diagnosed in people over the age of 65. So you're dealing with a lot of older people with renal tumor. And the age has an important bearing in how we treat patients with renal tumor. When the diagnosis of renal tumor is made, almost 65%, two thirds of the cases are localized, meaning they're either T1 or T2, meaning these are tumors all localized in the kidney. And when you look at 65% of the renal tumors are localized, and those people who need treat them, the five-year survival is 92.6%. That is really is excellent. The next most common we see is the regional tumor. That means renal tumor, which has metastasized to the regional lymph nodes. And approximately 16% of the newly diagnosed cases are a regional <coughs> with re <coughs> regional node metastasis. And those patients, the five-year survival is about 70.4%. Mm -hmm. 
about 16% of the newly diagnosed cases are metastatic renal cancer, and the five-year survival of those patients are pretty dismal at about 13%. I think what is important in this slide, especially for the in-service is take a look at this. The T1 tumor are less than seven centimeter tumor and they can be classified into T1A, which is under four centimeter. T1B is over four, between four and seven centimeter. T2 will be over seven centimeter size tumor. T2A will be between seven and 10 centimeter and tumor size over 10 centimeter localized in the kidney will be T2B. In T3, the tumor has extended into the major veins, specifically the renal veins, or into the perinephric tissue. In T3A, the tumor extends into the renal vein or renal sinus fat. In the past staging system from 2009, this was classified at T3B. So that's an important distinction that right now renal tumor involving the renal vein will be classified as T3A. T3B will be when the tumor extends into the vena cava. If it is below the diaphragm, it's T3B. If it's above the diaphragm, that is T3C. So that's one of the distinction with the previous staging system that T3A is now renal vein involvement. Previously, it used to be classified as T3B because the prognosis of T3A is better than prognosis in patient with T3B and T3C. T4 will be invasion into the gerodous fascia or contiguous extension into the adrenal gland. So if the tumor extends into the adrenal gland, that will be uh, classified as a T4 disease. On the other hand, if it's a non-contiguous solitary nodule in the adrenal gland that will be M1. So that's an in, important distinction from the previous classification. And X, meaning no regional lymph node, M0 lymph node involvement, and N1 uh, positive lymph node. M0 no distant metastasis, and M1 will be distant metastasis. So we can put that into stage grouping system, and stage one will be uh, basically T1 disease, stage two, again, T2 disease, tumor, over seven centimeter, but limited to the kidney. At stage three is basically the tumor which are T1, T2, or N plus, or T3 disease. And stage four will be either T4 or any T, any N, or any M1 disease will be classified as uh, stage four disease. So uh, the the most recent published guideline for renal mass and localized renal cancer is from 2017. And what they primarily focused on is clinically localized renal masses suspicious for cancer in adults, including solid enhancing renal tumors and Bosnia three and four complex cystic renal masses. So that was the primary focus of the 2017 AUA guideline. And what is different in this new guideline are the following. I think that is important to remember there was a lot of emphasis on functional outcome after renal surgery, specifically renal function, because renal function has a significant impact on other, especially even the longevity of the patient, as well as other outcomes. So there is a great deal of emphasis in the new guideline on functional outcome after renal uh, surgery, renal tumor, or any treatment. One of the thing in this new guideline where they really define that what is the role of radical nephrectomy? When should we perform radical nephrectomy? That was very well defined in this new guideline. And the primary thrust of treatment really is partial nephrectomy for most T1A and maybe even T1B renal tumor. They also, the guideline talked about selective utilization of thermal ablation, especially it is most effective for tumor under three centimeters. The other thing in the new guideline, which was at a great deal of emphasis, is which patients are ideal for active surveillance. And there was significant discussion regarding shared decision-making about active surveillance, and they defined it explicitly that how those patients should be handled. 
So, so I'll encourage all of the residents really to really read the 2017 area guideline on renal mass. But you can really summarize the entire guideline in these following nine panels. It starts with the evaluation and diagnosis. <clears throat> then it goes into counseling, renal mass biopsy, role of partial nephrectomy, role of radical nephrectomy, thermal ablation, active surveillance. And I'll try to go over each of these over the next half an hour. So the mainstay of diagnosis in renal mass will be multi-phase high quality cross-sectional abdominal imaging, either CT or an MRI. The ideal test for renal mass will be a dedicated pre and post contrast enhanced CT scan. And what the CT scan we look for really is to characterize the renal mass itself, stage the renal mass, because the staging is primarily dependent on the size of the tumor and the local extent of the disease. If there is enhancement of the renal mass over 15 to 20 Hounsfield unit, it is indicative of renal cell cancer. In the CT, we try to assess for local advanced features, such as is it involving contiguous structures, such as the adrenal gland or any other contiguous structure. We look for lymph node enlargement, as well as is there any evidence intra-abdominal metastasis into other organs. It will be important to look at the growth pattern of the tumor. If it's an infiltrated growth pattern, we really should look into is this, could this be a urothelial cancer, which looks like a renal cancer? Could this be lymphoma, infectious process, or a sarcomatoid tumor? All of these should be in the differential diagnosis. If your renal mass shows substantial amount of fat, then that will be indicative of an angiomyolipoma. If for some reason we cannot do a CAT scan, MRI is an alternate modality for characterization of renal mass. Enhancement of over 20% with ibogadolinium is suggestive of RCC. And MRI is helpful in defining tissue plane and extent of vascular involvement, especially if you're looking for extent of vascular involvement, renal vein, vena cava, MRI is great for that one. There is, of course, some concern with MRI and nephrogenic systemic fibrosis. It happens mostly in patients with a stage four or five kidney disease or patients who are on dialysis. The newer gadoliniums are usually less likely to cause nephrogenic systemic fibrosis. So MRI will be an alternative to CT scan in defining renal masses. What else should you do? The patient should have a comprehensive metabolic panel, the CBC and the UA. Normally, we will only do a chest X-ray. We do a chest CT scan if there are pulmonary symptoms, chest X-ray is abnormal, or there is a high-risk disease where you suspect pulmonary metastasis. We do a bone scan only if the patient has bone pain or elevated alkaline phosphatase. We do brain imaging only if there are neurological symptoms. I think what is important for all of us to remember <clears throat> that every time we see a patient with a renal mass, we should always try to assign a CKD stage based on G GFR and degree of proteinuria. Because how we treat the patient will also depend on what is the baseline renal function in most of these patients. When we are looking at a patient with renal cell cancer, as we make treatment decision, the following three factors are really critical as we make a decision regarding treatment of any renal mass. Age obviously is an important factor, the comorbidity and baseline renal function. So let's start with one at, at a time, the age. What is the impact of age on the management of renal mass? So in this study, there are 537 patients. These are patients over 75 years of age. All of them were treated for clinical stage T1 disease. They had either radical nephrectomy, partial nephrectomy, or someone in active, on active surveillance. The patients who were treated surgically, they are all node negative. 
if you look at cancer specific mortality in the middle panel, either partial nephrectomy, radical nephrectomy, or surveillance, the cancer specific mortality was quite low, 4% for partial nephrectomy, 5.8% for surveillance, and 9.3% for radical nephrectomy. Obviously, patients with radical nephrectomy has more advanced disease. But you look at the right side panel, that's the overall mortality. Almost five times more patients died of other causes. Patients with active surveillance, almost six times more patients. 33% of the patient died of unrelated cause when only there are 5.8% died of renal cancer. What that tells us that patients with renal cancer, many of them, especially patients over 75, have multiple other comorbidities which are more likely to be the cause of the patient's demise rather than the renal cancer itself. This is another study and this is a SEER database study. And these are patients over the age of 66. And these are patients, again, kidney cancer treated with surgery, either partial or radical nephrectomy. All of them had pathologically negative node status. And if you look at the 10 year, cancer specific mortality was only 11.9% in that group of patients. On the other hand, overall mortality was four times higher at 44%. What that means that many of the patients we see with renal cell cancer, they are older and they usually have multiple other comorbidities and many of their cause of death is unrelated to renal cancer. So we always have to consider age itself as an important factor as we decide on the treatment, as well as other comorbidities. This study from Hopkins, uh, they basically looked at the cardiovascular risk and cancer death. And they, they divided patients with cardiovascular risk into high and low. High cardiovascular risk are patients with congestive heart failure, those who have cerebrovascular disease or peripheral vascular disease or history of MI. If they had any of those things, they considered them high risk. If they did not have any of those above four things, they considered them low risk disease. And look what happens in this patient. That is survival, chance of survival. If the patient has low cardiovascular risk, this solid line is deferred treatment, basically active surveillance. The top one, red line is the partial nephrectomy and then is radical nephrectomy. So the patient with low cardiovascular risk did much better with surgical treatment. Then you look at the patient with high cardiovascular risk, whether you deferred the treatment, did radical nephrectomy or partial nephrectomy, made very little difference in patients with high cardiovascular risk. Meaning that many patients with renal cell cancer with high cardiovascular risk, treatment probably made very little difference. But on the other hand, in low risk disease, it made significant difference. So what the conclusion of this study was that the cardiovascular morbidities exert a significant impact on survival of patients with small renal mass, Low cardiovascular risk patients had better survival with surgery compared to deferred treatment or surveillance. High cardiovascular risk patients had similar cancer survival, regardless of the treatment, whether it's partial nephrectomy, radical nephrectomy, or deferred treatment. The next thing I'll talk a little bit about is the baseline renal function. We need to pay really a great deal of attention to the baseline renal function whenever we have a patient with renal cell, renal mass, and which need to be treated. So this is a seminal article which was published in 2004 in New England Journal of Medicine. And they basically looked at patients with chronic kidney disease and the risk of death, cardiovascular event, and hospitalization. And if you look at patients on this one, so these are patients on the left side, the patients essentially with GFR over 60 ml per minute, their risk of cardiovascular event was very low. 
the patients who had CKD3A, meaning the GFR between 45 and 59, they did somewhat worse, but not significantly. But once you go to CKD3B, that means GFR is under 44, CKD stage four, CKD stage five, you look at the steep rise of cardiovascular event and the patient has CKD. So meaning that patients with renal tumor, if they have CKD, their risk of other cardiovascular event is extremely high. So the risk became evident when the GFR was under 60, but it was substantially in increased when the GFR was under 45 ml per minute. This is an interesting study of basically they divided up patient with CKD and they call it CKDS, CKD surgery. That means the patient who had kidney disease after partial or radical nephrectomy. And those patients who had both CKDS but also had medical renal disease, they call it CKDM, medical renal disease. So if you look at this graph, and that's the probability of GFR dropping by 50% or going into dialysis over a 10 year period of time. If the patient had no CKD, their chance of dropping GFR by 50% is really about 15%. And patient with CKDS, that means they had chronic kidney disease following partial or radical nephrectomy was slightly higher, but not much different. But these are patients did not have any medical renal disease. But once the patient starts having medical renal disease, that means they have CKD, both from medical renal disease, as well as from the surgical treatment, whether partial or radical nephrectomy, the probability of GFR drop, as well as dialysis, increases sharply in there. So what that really tells us that if the patient have medical renal disease, in addition to renal mass, we gotta be much more careful because their risk of significant drop in GFR or needing even dialysis is significantly higher. This one is the probability of all cause mortality in the same group of patients. And if you look at, there is no CKD, all cause mortality is really less than 20%. If CKD is slightly higher, but if there is CKD, medical renal disease and surgical combined, then the risk goes up very significantly. What does it mean? That the surgical CKD, that means CKD we create by doing a partial or a radical nephrectomy, is associated with more stable renal function and better overall survival, provided they don't have any medical renal disease. Patients with pre existing CKD should receive optimized nephron sparing surgery. That's the bottom line. That if the patient has existing CKD, we've got to be very careful and try to preserve as much of the nephron as possible. So the baseline renal function requires careful consideration in patients with newly diagnosed renal cell cancer. CKD is associated with adverse long-term sequelae and mortality. Pre-existing CKD related to other medical comorbidities such as di diabetes mellitus, hypertension, demonstrate less stability over time compared to purely surgical induced CKD. That's why, you know, the guideline puts a lot of emphasis on counseling the patient, that how we should, the counseling of the patient should be led by the urologist. We should really look at the biology of the tumor. We'll talk a little bit about this. We specifically really should address the issue of comorbidities and specifically issue, address the issue of renal function as we decide how the patient should be treated. The patient may, who have compromised renal function, probably should get a nephrology consult ahead of time. What are the tumor related factors we should look at? And obviously tumor size is important. We looked at that the size of the tumor has direct bearing on how well the patients do. Larger the tumor, more likely it's a higher grade tumor, more likely they may have metastatic disease. 
the complexity of the tumor we see is very important. And we'll talk a little bit about the nephrometric scope. What is the role of renal mass biopsy and the extent of disease? So the tumor size is directly related to the risk of malignancy and the presence of high-grade pathology. If the tumor is less than one centimeter in size, then the risk of malignancy is only 54.7%. It goes up to between three and four centimeter. The risk of malignancy goes up significantly to 80%. If the tumor is over seven centimeter, then the risk of malignancy is almost 95%. So the larger the tumor, the more likely it is malignant. This is uh, Paul Rousseau's group uh, published this one on close to 2,691 patients. And they basically looked at the size of the tumor and the synchronous metastasis, the patient who presented with metastasis at the same time. So you look at tumors under three centimeters, the chance of having metastasis at the time of presentation is only one in 781 patients. So it is extremely rare. On the other hand, as the tumor becomes larger in size, especially over five centimeters, the risk of synchronous metastasis increases dramatically. And once the tumor is over seven centimeter, the risk of synchronous metastasis at the time of presentation is almost 17%. And the tumor size and the risk of high grade tumor is also, this is looking at almost close to 20,000 patients, that 85% of the tumor under four centimeter have low grade tumor. And for every one centimeter increase in tumor size, the risk of high-grade pathology increased by 13%. That's very significant, that every centimeter increase in size, the risk of high-grade pathology increases by 13%. So the size of the tumor has a direct bearing on prognosis. The complexity of the tumor becomes important as we make treatment decisions, such as this patient, on the left side panel, there is a small peripheral tumor. You could treat it almost with anything. It could be active surveillance, thermal ablation, or partial nephrectomy. Which one is the best treatment, of course, will depend on what we discussed before, the age, the comorbidities, and the baseline renal function. The one in the middle panel, it's a larger tumor, over four centimeter in size. It's quite close to the collecting system. And this patient may not be an ideal candidate for active surveillance just because of the size of the tumor, it's close to four centimeter. It may not be ideal for thermal ablation because it's close to the collecting system. And the best treatment maybe for this guy is partial nephrectomy, but again, depends on the age, the comorbidity, and baseline renal function. In this case, the, this panel, there is a fairly large complex tumor. In this patient, if it's a normal contralateral kidney, normal baseline renal function, this patient may be, a, may be a candidate for radical nephrectomy. On the other hand, if it is a compromised renal function or solitary kidney, I think we're going to attempt a partial nephrectomy. So the size of the tumor and the complexity of the tumor becomes important as we make treatment decisions. Now, Bob Uzo, as well as Alex Kritikov, I think they address this issue with the nephrometry score, and I'm sure most of you know, it's a called renal R for radius. If the tumor is less than four centimeter, you get one point. If the tumor is over four centimeter under seven, you get two points. If the tumor is over seven centimeter, you get three points. Exophytic. If the tumor is less than 50%, more than 50% exophytic, you get one. Less than 50%, you get two. Uh, if it is almost totally endophytic, the, you, get, the, you get three numbers. Similarly, if it's nearer to the collecting system, far away, one, you know, within four to five millimeter, you get two points. And if it is in the collecting system, you get three points. Similarly, close to the location line, again, if it's close to the collecting system, as well as the renal hilum, uh, the further you get close, you get more points on this one. So based on this, they came up with this score. 
So if it's a peripheral tumor, this patient's everything gets one, and it'll be a four nephrometry score. On the other hand, this patient will have almost nine. And this patient uh, will have uh, almost 10 in the score. So depending on the complexity of the tumor, the nephrometry score will go up. And if we look at the real nephrometry score and the degree of complexity, complexity regarding surgery, if you're deciding to do a partial nephrectomy. So if it's a four to six nephrometry score, it will be considered low degree of complexity. Seven to nine will be medium and 10 to 12 will be a high degree of complexity. So higher it gets in the complexity, the more complex the tumor becomes, more likely it is higher grade the more likely it is, it is going to be a more difficult partial nephrectomy if that's what the patient needs. And it is more likely the patient with higher complexity will have higher degree of complication. So assessment of tumor anatomic complexity provides important information for clinical decision-making and Tumors with low nephrometry score between four to six are more likely to be benign than those with higher complexity score. High nephrometry score is also associated with higher complication rate. What is the role of renal mass biopsy? So again, if we biopsy this one, the most of them, over 70% of them will turn out to be clear cell cancer, and the rest of them could be papillary type 1, type 2, chromophobe or oncocytoma, or sometimes rare variant tumors. So one of the concerns all which people raise, what is the diagnostic accuracy of a biopsy, and what is the risk related to the biopsy? And there are now, this is a meta-analysis of almost 20 studies looking at over 3,000 patients, and the non-diagnostic rate was 14.1%. And again, if you repeat the biopsy, then the non-diagnostic rate will come down significantly. The complication rate of renal mass biopsy is quite low, hematoma 4.9%, and most of these hematoma needs no intervention. The pain, gross hematuria, pneumothorax, hemorrhage are quite low. So this is again what the guideline says uh, regarding the renal mass biopsy. The renal mass biopsy should be considered when a mass is suspected to be hematologic, metastatic, inflammatory, or infectious. Beyond this, you should use RMB only. It will make a difference in how you will treat it. For instance, in a young, healthy guy, if you're going to do a partial nephrectomy during a renal mass biopsy, probably is not very useful. Same is true. If the patient is older and frail, and you are going to be observing the patient, probably does not make a difference if you do a biopsy. So we should do a biopsy, only it will make a difference how you treat the patient. So when considering the utility of renal mass biopsy, patients should be counseled regarding rationale, positive and negative predictive value, potential risk, and non-diagnostic risk of renal mass biopsy. Positive biopsy can be trusted. If the positive biopsy, the sensitivity is 98%, specificity is 96%, and positive predictive value is 99.8%. That means most renal biopsy is very accurate. Now we'll look at the other things about the role of partial nephrectomy. I think we are coming to the end. So the partial nephrectomy and nephron sparing approaches, that's where one of the emphasis of the new guideline for 2017, that whenever possible, urology should consider doing a partial nephrectomy. Prioritize partial nephrectomy for the management of especially T1 renal mass and maybe even many T, T1B renal mass. We should do partial nephrectomy if there's anatomic or functionally solitary kidney, if there are bilateral tumors, known familiar RCT, pre-existing CKD or proteinuria. So these are fairly obvious that most of these patients, whenever possible, we should try to do a partial nephrectomy. We should consider doing partial nephrectomy in younger people, patients who have multifocal masses or comorbid comorbidities that are likely to impact renal function in the future, such as diabetes mellitus, hypertension, etc. 
What is the principle of partial nephrectomy? That means we try to preserve as much, as many nephrons as possible. Is a wide margin necessary? The margin should be really dictated by the surgical team that if the tumor is complex, we might go with a smaller margin. So the margin will be at the discretion of the surgeon at that point. We should always try to achieve a negative surgical margin should be a priority because people with positive surgical margin have the higher risk of local recurrence. So every attempt should be made to attain a negative margin. We can consider enucleation rather than partial nephrectomy in patients with familiar renal cell cancer, multifocal disease, or severe CKD. What, what is the role of thermal ablation? Again, the new guideline defined the role of thermal ablation. It should be, it can be considered as a treatment alternative in patient with less than three centimeter tumor in size. We should counsel the patient about thermal ablation, that there is an increased likelihood of tumor persistent or local recurrence after primary thermal ablation relative to surgical extirpation, such as partial nephrectomy. However, even if there is local recurrence after thermal ablation, you can do a second treatment, especially patients with multiple comorbidities. Patients who elect to have thermal ablation, a percutaneous technique is preferred rather than laparoscopic or open. Both RFA and cryoablation are options. And we should, RMB should be performed prior to ablation to know the grade of the tumor. I think that can be important in decision making. What about active surveillance? So for patients with a small solid or Bosniak 3-4 complex cystic renal mass, especially those under two centimeter, active surveillance is an option for initial management. However, whenever we are talking about active surveillance, it sh should be a shared decision-making between the patient and the surgeon. Yeah. We should carefully consider the ant anticipated risk of intervention especially for partial nephrectomy or thermal ablation. And we should always consider the competing risk of death, like we have talked about previously. Which patient should really can be considered for active surveillance? Patient-related factors. If the patient is elderly, life expectancy is less than five years. Patient with high comorbidities, excessive perioperative risk, patient with poor functional status, marginal renal function, and patient prefers to do be on active surveillance. Tumor-related factor, if the tumor is less than three centimeters, that will be ideal for active surveillance. And we've got to follow the growth rate of the tumor over time, and the growth rate should be less than five millimeter per year. And the tumor should be non-infiltrative on imaging study. Infiltrative tumor are not great candidates for surveillance because they are likely to be more aggressive, likely to be higher grade, or likely to be of a typical pathologic variant. The tumor should be of low complexity. The lower the complexity, the more likely they are to be benign or to be of lower grade. And if we did a RMB, it should be of favorable histology. Those are the ideal candidates for active surveillance. One of the things the new guideline is, is defined the role of radical nephrectomy. When should you do the radical nephrectomy? Physicians should consider radical nephrectomy for patients where increased oncology potential is suggested by the size of the tumor. If the tumor is big, if you did a renal mass biopsy, higher grade tumor, under imaging, like one on the right side, which is encroaching into the collecting system, these patients may be candidate for radical nephrectomy provided that there is no pre-existing CKD, there is normal contralateral kidney, and you expect that the new baseline GFR after the radical nephrectomy will be above 45 ml per minute. What other surgical principle you should consider? In the presence of clinically concerning, uh, if there is a concerning for regional lymphadenopathy, we should do a lymph node dissection for staging purpose primarily. Adrenalectomy should be performed if imaging and or intraoperative findings suggest metastasis or direct invasion in the adrenal gland. 
you know, we should always prefer a minimally invasive approach, uh, if possible, for the surgical procedure. And at the time of partial nephrectomy, we should really try to biopsy the adjacent renal parenchyma to look for any existing CKD. And that might even be true even if we did a radical nephrectomy. The pathologist can always look at the parenchyma away from the tumor, look for evidence of existing CKD. I think the last few minutes, we we'll just talk about the hereditary RCC syndromes. Of all of them, there are many, but four of them are the most common. Von Hippel-Lindau disease, you, you see hereditary clear cell, renal cell cancer. Hereditary papillary renal cell cancer, Barthog dubé where you mostly see oncocytoma and hereditary lyomyoma renal cell cancer syndrome. All of them are autosomal dominant. This is a slide and I'm not sure exactly where I got the slide, but I really got to give credit to, uh, I believe it came in from NIH. So this is what happens. So what is the VHL gene? And I think this is always a bold question. It's in 3P25 and it is a tumor suppressor gene. So the VHL gene is in 3P25. The hereditary papillary renal cell, papillary renal cell cancer is in 7Q31 and it's a CMAT gene and it's an oncogene, not a tumor suppressor gene, an oncogene. barthog duve gene, is in 17P11.2, it's a tumor suppressor gene. So this usually is sometimes in the in-service questions. And lastly, this is for the hereditary renal cell cancer, lyomyomatous renal cell cancer, that's in 7Q31. And these are for the tuberous sclerosis complex gene, in 9Q34. So features of hereditary renal cell cancer, what are the features in the individual patient? They're usually bilateral, they're usually multifocal. Most patients are younger, under 35 years of age, and they're associated with other genetic or congenital traits. And there is sometimes there is a strong family history. So we'll talk briefly about the barthog duve syndrome. So again, the tumor suppressor gene is located at 17P, and the syndromes include fibrofolliculoma and mostly located on the face and the neck. These are usually painless, and they develop after the age of 30. The tumors are usually bilateral and multifocal. Most commonly, it's usually chromophobe or oncocytoma, but conventional renal cell cancer and papillary cancer can also occur in PhD. What are the other association? And that sometimes is an in-service question. Some patients may have pulmonary cyst and present with spontaneous pneumothorax. Patient kept colonic polyp and cancer and PTH adenomas. This is an interesting one, is the hereditary lyomyoma renal cell cancer. And this is a, is in the fumarate hydratase and located at 1Q42. It is probably a tumor suppressor gene, and the syndrome includes cutaneous lyomyoma, often painful, unlike BHD, cutaneous fibro folliculoma, which are painless. And a lot of patients may present with uterine lyomyoma as fibroid uterus. They're usually multiple, painful, and before the age of 30. What happens in these patients is the type two renal cell cancer. And what is important for us to know is these are, can be small tumor and capable of metastasis even when small. Aggressive and they can lead to death even in early 30s. They may be solitary, multiple or bilateral. Hereditary papillary renal cell cancer, mutation in the CMET oncogene located at 7Q31. And in this malformation, it is only confined to the kidney. There is no other manifestation anywhere else. It is the rarest form of hereditary renal cell cancer. It can be bilateral, multiple type one papillary 
renal cell cancer. Lastly, the von Hippel Lindau disease. And again, this is many a time in the in service. And the gene is located at 3P25, which is a tumor suppressor gene. And the syndrome includes, most of us know, retinal angiomas, hemangioblastomas, they're usually benign, mostly in the spine and the cerebellum. Patient can have pancreatic cyst, islet tumor, pheochromocytoma, uh, epithelial cyst adenoma, and in the kidney, RCC, clear cell type, and renal cysts. I think we have, uh, we'll start with the CSEP question set. So this is uh, question number one. Uh, this is a 57-year-old woman with a CT scan for severe left-sided flank pain. The pre and post contrast CT scans are shown. The pre contrast on the left side, post contrast on the right side. So the patient presents with severe left sided flank pain. And what I think it shows is perirenal hematoma on this one. So the next step is what they are telling can you do a repeat CT scan in three months? Should you put a percutaneous nephrostomy tube, drain the hematoma, renal biopsy, versus do an immediate radical nephrectomy? So the answer on this one really is the repeat CT scan in three months. And the reason for that is because the most common cause of spontaneous perirenal hemorrhage is small renal tumor. So the options could be either repeat CT scan in three months or radical nephrectomy. However, in this CAT scan, we don't see a renal mass. And doing a CT radical nephrectomy immediately may be questioned. On the other hand, we just recently had a patient in our service. Patient presented almost exactly the same. And I know uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Phillips and uh, our new faculty, Dr. Wong, took care of it with a radical nephrectomy and the patient had a four centimeter renal cell cancer. So again, the board or in-service answer is repeat CT scan in three months because we do not see a specific renal mass. In three months time, if we do a CT scan, we might see that. And at that time, radical nephrectomy may be more appropriate. A 39-year-old man, this is the second question, a 39-year-old man with VHL disease has a four centimeter left upper pole renal mass and several simple appearing lower pole renal cyst on the right side. The right kidney also has several cysts as well as a two 1.2 centimeter lower pole solid masses. Renal function is normal. The next step is, so on the left side, he has a four centimeter renal mass and several simple appearing cysts. On the right side, 1.2 centimeter mass. That's where the patient is. Should the patient have radiofrequency ablation of the left renal mass? Now, it's a four centimeter mass. It might be quite big for radiofrequency ablation. Staged bilateral radiofrequency ablation. The tumor on the right side is 1.2 centimeter. And tumors less than three centimeter with VHL disease, a lot of time we should watch them to see if they grow. So that is not the answer. Should you do a left radical nephrectomy? We should always try to avoid a nephrectomy in patients with VHL disease because they are usually bilateral. So that is not the answer. Should you do left renal exploration with the reception of solid mass and renal cyst and bilateral partial nephrectomy? Because the mass on the right side is small, less than three centimeter, that can be watched. So the answer in this patient, because the mass on the left side is four centimeter, that should be excised and the cyst should be removed because there is always some risk of developing tumor in those cysts in VHL. So the correct answer on this one is D, which is left renal exploration with resection of solid mass and renal cyst. A 68 year old man, this is the third question, has a five centimeter partially exophytic, 40% exophytic, that means 60% endophytic, 
enhancing renal mass with a renal nephrometry score of 12. So a 12 nephrometry score will be high complexity. He has creatinine of 0 0.8 milligram per deciliter and a normal appearing contralateral kidney. He has moderate COPD and cardiovascular disease. According to the AUA guideline, the next step is, so this is a guy, a high complexity tumor. The serum creatinine level is normal. Even if you remove that kidney, the CKDS should not be too bad. The guy has COPD and cardiovascular disease. So he has other comorbidities. So these are the answers. Uh, should he have radiofrequency ablation? This is a large tumor. So radiofrequency ablation, and it's a complex tumor. So that is not the answer. Paracutaneous cryoablation, for the same reason, it's a five centimeter mass and a complex mass. So percutaneous cryoablation is not the answer. Should he have partial nephrectomy? Again, that's always a possibility, but it's a high nephrometry score, a complex mass in someone with comorbidities. And he has a normal renal function, normal appearing contralateral kidney. So the answer in this case is D, which is radical nephrectomy. Radical nephrectomy because high complexity renal mass, normal serum creatinine, even if you did a radical nephrectomy, the GFR should be over 45 ml per minute. A 78-year-old man has a three centimeter solid enhancing mass at the posterior aspect of his right kidney. Biopsy reveals renal cell cancer, grade three. His creatinine is 2.1. He is treated with percutaneous cryoablation. Imaging one year later demonstrate persistent central enhancement of the tumor bag. So this is a 70 year old older man, three centimeter solid enhancing mass, but his RCC is grade three. Creatinine, he already has baseline renal dysfunction, 2.1. He had cryoablation. A year later, it still shows enhancement in the tumor bed. What should be the next step? Observation. I think that can be a reasonable option. The guy is 78, and you can see what happens to it. So that can be an option. Renal mass biopsy. So usually, if the patient had a biopsy proven grade three renal cell cancer, you did cryoablation, and you see central enhancement, you don't need to do a biopsy because it is recurrent or persistent tumor. So renal biopsy is not needed. Should you do a repeat cryoablation? Should you do a partial nephrectomy? Should you do a radical nephrectomy? Obviously, we should not do a radical nephrectomy. He already has compromised renal function. Partial nephrectomy in this patient can be difficult. Plus, this gentleman is 78 years old with compromised renal function. And there is no guarantee that you can do a partial nephrectomy after a cryoablation. So we might end up either losing the kidney or lose significantly more renal parenchyma than we think. So in this patient, I think the guideline is very clear that in this patient, if you have thermal ablation, there is residual or recurrent central enhancement. Usually you think of these recurrent tumor in there and they can be treated with repeat cryoablation because the result is not bad with the repeat cryoablation. So repeat cryoablation is the answer in this patient. A 52-year-old man with hematuria has a right-sided four centimeter infiltrative renal mass, distorting the collecting system. So remember, one of the things we always should look for in the CAT scan or an MRI, is it an infiltrative type of mass? Because whenever there is an infiltrative mass, the differential diagnosis got to be expanded. And this patient already had a left radical nephrectomy for RCC three years ago. So this is a solitary kidney and he has an infiltrative mass. So what are the differential diagnosis of infiltrative mass? It could still be a renal cell cancer, that is the most likely. It could be a urothelial cancer involving the kidney. It could be lymphoma. It could be a sarcomatoid type of tumor. So those are the differential diagnoses. The chest and abdominal CT scans are otherwise negative. What do you do? The next step is radiofrequency ablation. Again, 
It's a four centimeter mass, larger than three centimeter. It's an infiltrated renal mass. It is distorting the collecting system. Radio frequency ablation can lead to fistula. So, and it may not be the ideal case for radio frequency ablation. Should the patient have partial nephrectomy? Remember, this is an infiltrative renal mass. It may not be ideal for partial nephrectomy. Should he have radical nephrectomy? The guy already had a nephrectomy on the other side. So that the patient will be anephrine requiring dialysis, but that may be an option. Should the patient have sunitinib? Now, that only is good usually for renal cell cancer. How do we know it's renal cell cancer? We don't know for sure. So the percutaneous biopsy of the renal mass will be the answer to establish the diagnosis because it might turn out to be urothelial cancer. Then chemotherapy will be an ideal depending on the renal function and other things. If it's a lymphoma, you treat it for lymphoma. So a percutaneous biopsy of the renal mass before doing any definitive therapy, I think is the answer in this guy with a solitary kidney and four centimeter infiltrated renal mass. Question number six, during left radical nephrectomy for a large tumor, a major artery is inadvertently transected large renal tumor, and it is on the left side. The artery most commonly mistaken for the renal artery in this setting is the, so anybody who has taken care of large tumor, if it did not happen, uh, I'm surprised. It does happen. It, ha it has happened to me at least twice. So, they, so how about the most artery most commonly mistaken for the renal artery in this setting is, is it inferior mesenteric artery? Usually no, it's fairly low, so it is unlikely to be mistaken. Superior mesenteric artery, inferior adrenal artery, splenic, and hypertrophic lumbar. Of all the things, which is because when there's a large mass and displaces the aorta, a lot of time the superior mesenteric artery wraps around the mass itself. And that can sometimes be mistaken for inner artery. So on the left side, superior mesenteric artery is the answer. The VHL- hey, uh, Dr. Chaudhry, I, I apologize. Just um, I, uh, we're, we're butting up against the hour. So maybe we can no. make this the, uh, the last question, no. if that's okay. Sure. No problem, absolutely. The VHL tumor suppressor gene regulates the expression of basic fibroblastic growth factor, epidermal growth factor, CMAT proto-oncogene, VEGF transforming growth factor. The answer is D, vascular endothelial growth factor. I'll end there. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much um, for sharing your time with us, uh, Dr. Chaudhry. That was an excellent talk and a, a great review of RCC, and those questions were very helpful. Um, I just want to let everybody know that um, on Thursday, we're going to be having a bladder cancer review with Dr. Sfakianos of Mount Sinai. Um, and again, we send all our um, our thanks to you, Dr. Chaudhry, for, uh, for both your time and expertise in this topic.